Hey, what are you watching this on? A smartphone, computer, tablet? What do you have, a cable modem, fiber optic connection? Are you using a fancy 5G network? What if you didn't have any of those speedy connections to let you watch anything at any time? Instead, what if the internet was barely accessible? How would you stay connected with the world? Where would you get your information and entertainment? If you're in Cuba, chances are this would be your port to the outside world. That's because the Cuban government restricts what people there can see. All media is tightly controlled. TV channels are limited, the news is censored, and internet access is limited to a privileged few. But that doesn't mean Cubans are uninformed. Cubans have been using a creative, if illegal, workaround to access content beyond their borders. And it's more popular now than ever. The problem with the internet is not it's just like a slow, it's also the, it's very, very unstable. That's Nestor Sire. He's a visual artist based in Havana, who's focused on data connectivity and informal ways of digital distribution in Cuba. Cuban government have fear of like a freedom of information, have fear about a very, very fast internet. And I think one of the limitations that they make is like, you know, keep the internet like that, like stable. To understand the enormous role this small piece of hardware plays in Cuban society, we have to look back on the country's history. After the Cuban Revolution of 1959, the Castro regime took control of the country's media to quash any and all government dissent. While you may have been doing this in the late 90s, you've got mail. Cuba was largely offline. Only a select few in the government had access to dial-up internet. As the world was becoming exponentially connected to the World Wide Web in the 1990s and 2000s, Cuba was still left mostly in the dark. The reason for this is complex. Among them, a lack of funding and a long-running trade embargo imposed by the U.S. government once the Castro regime came to power. We don't produce any technology in Cuba that can be used for infrastructure of communication. Everything we are using here is like coming from outside. By the mid-2000s, only a small number of professionals like doctors and journalists were legally allowed to have internet access in their home. And it stayed that way for more than a decade. Cubans were not allowed to privately own computers until 2008. By 2014, while 80% of American households had access to home internet, only 4% of Cubans had that same connectivity. In 2016, the landscape started changing. The Cuban government started installing Wi-Fi points around major cities. A few years later, Cubans could access a DSL connection from their home. In 2018, the government introduced 3G mobile data service. The year after that, private Wi-Fi was legalized, though only attainable through a permit. Today, internet connectivity is much improved, but still out of reach for many. Households can access the internet through a DSL connection, but it costs $10 to $20 a month, depending on your speed. Wi-Fi is available, but it's a dollar per hour of data. The average income in Cuba is just under $160 a month. That's where devices like these come in. In the absence of broadband internet, Cubans have created an underground network for global content distribution. It's called El Paquete Semanal, or the weekly packet. Sometimes it's a thumb drive like this, or it could be a hard drive or a CD-ROM, packed with up to one terabyte of content and distributed every week. Inside, there are movies, TV shows, cartoons, music videos, mobile apps, software, classified ads, video games, digital magazines, and more. Imagine a version of the internet, but completely offline in a hard drive. Everything you watch or all the entertainment materials that you are consuming for a week, this one terabyte of information is in the weekly packet. Nestor's art has been featured in the weekly packet, including this mobile game called Packet Town that lets you simulate the weekly packet experience. His interest in content distribution might be in his blood. His grandfather owned a bookstore during the Cuban Revolution, when all private businesses came under government control. 
and all these small stores that sell or rent books, they just, you know, stop to have options to import new books. And when this happened, like my grandfather one was of this person that just have a lot of books and all the clients in the town already read all the books and they start to exchange books. And this is the beginning of the like a like a national like a net you know sharing information about you know entertainment material. After the books come in the the videotapes you know Betacan and, and VHS. After the videotape come in the CDs and DVDs. And after that computers, hard drive, USB. And after that the weekly packet as we'll know today. So here's how it works. Only people with privileged access to the internet and satellite TV can download and record content that is compiled into the weekly packet. Local artists and music promoters will add their own media along with local advertisers. The external drives cost only a dollar or two to rent and are distributed by an informal network of data traffickers called paqueteros. The hard drives are delivered through a well-organized messenger system or picked up at certain spots like the back of a cell phone repair store or DVD shops. It's insane how fast is this process, even if it's completely offline, completely decentralized system. This is one of the ways that people consume that. In any block in Cuba, you can find this a kind of like a cyber cafe. It's like a weekly packet cell points. You have a computer, you come in, you sit down with an older worker from the business. They are like a super professional. They know all the movies, all the cartoons, all the TV shows, and you're just asking, okay, I, I want to see the last like a uh, Marvel movie or you know what is what is what is the new the new movie that you have? They show you the trailer. They show you some like a poster of the movie and you say, okay, I want that. In the early days of the weekly packet, the Cuban government tried to suppress it by creating a rival version called Malatin or Mochila, which means a bag or backpack. It included classical movies, music, and educational materials. But the government look alike never gained quite the momentum as El Paquete. Today, the Cuban government tolerates the weekly packet, but with conditions. The first one is like a, not pornography, is like a, is anything about pornography material in the weekly packet. And the second limitation is like a political uh, content, you know, nothing that is directly, uh, you know, attacking the idea of the revolution in Cuba. It's not illegal, it's like a, a legal, it's a concept that we'll have here. It's, they are in some point between like a be legal and be illegal. They are not completely illegal because because of the embargo, we don't have any rules about copyright in Cuba. Right now, we can say that all these sales coin of a weekly packet that you can find in the street, they are paying to the government taxes for selling the weekly packet. They are selling the weekly packet. They are more like an entertainment digital you know, space in the city. It's not a problem to sell the weekly packet today. Today, only about 5% of the population has consistent internet access. Yet most of Cuba's population regularly engages with media from El Paquete. All the Cubans have like a, a USB or a hard drive in the packet, like all the time. The offline practice in Cuba is very, very, very strong. And, and it's because, you know, we'll just get internet after 2016. The access to internet from like a social, you know, perspective is very, very, very new. Though the story of El Paquete is one of determination and ingenuity, the fact that this underground network is still necessary in 2023 reminds us how very slow the march of progress has been for the Cuban people. While internet access is vastly expanded, it's still ultimately controlled by the government, who block sites that are critical of the Cuban government and shut down access to social media sites to quell protests. And while El Paquete may provide some degree of relief for a people eager for outside information, being forced to rely on one anonymous source of information consumed in secret is far from ideal. Until next time, I'm Hari Srinivasan and this is Take on Fake. Thanks for watching.